Hey guys. Hey, hope you're doing well. Um, just a short video. Just want to interact with some of your comments and um, once again, just really enjoying reading your stuff and it seems like you're really grappling with um, the information and so I just wanted to to talk just a little bit uh, about some, uh, once again, some of the things that you're writing and answering some of your questions, and, and I'll try to respond once again on email in the next day or two. Um, but I hope you're really, it, what's interesting is is all of you are seeing how um, applicable uh, this material is. And obviously because I think it's hitting on where we came from as in our own context and culture and country and and how we were formed. And um, once again, I feel like, as we've said a couple of times, sometimes we paint our history through rose-colored glasses. And I hope what you're learning is sometimes the truths that that um, seemed like they came from the Bible about our nation um, sometimes aren't necessarily the way that the things were. And that we, we potentially did a lot of harm um, rather than good and, and potentially puffed up our own ideas rather than the ideas of scripture and uh, I just did a sermon yesterday on the Sabbath and it's just um, fascinating to really study about the roots of the Sabbath and what trying to, to understand that, that there's a bigger picture to just this um, what we have traditionally called a 24-hour period that we should rest and and I think that's important I think that's good but I think Sabbath points to something bigger than just that day and we often miss the bigger because we're just focused on where we are and uh and so i think that that as we study history as we go through all of these things and uh, aj um i think pointed out that that we we want to learn so that we don't make the same mistakes and are there ways that we are still potentially doing the same things over and over again um that that we need to stop or we need to really think about or are there things happening in culture that we as the church need to be calling out need to be naming and we're afraid because sometimes um when you start to to call out culture and and um especially potentially uh ideologies that maybe people in your church have that they think is christian but doesn't really add up you run the risk of people leaving the church and then your tithing goes down. I mean, it's just could be a snowball effect. And so unfortunately, in our history as the church, we um, cater to the people with the big pocketbooks. And um, so it can be hard to be a prophet. It can be hard to say things that that um, that are true. Um, and people just want you to stay away from those things, stay away from from that stuff and just just preach how we need to love each other. Um but there is a, an aspect of of being a pastor or being a leader in the church that that really tries to look at the bigger picture and what's going on, and and there needs to be some 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 calling out, you might say. And it isn't fun, it isn't easy. But if we don't, then we're just doomed to repeat um, where we've been and. I'm not saying you should get a bullhorn. I'm not saying that you should um, just get after it every Sunday. But we have to lead our people um, in in such a way that that helps form them and shape them to live the kingdom, and um, and to live, to see what that means for their lives, their everyday lives. And um, and so we we have to sometimes say the hard things um, because we see the discrepancies. And once again, because we've understood what has happened in history, we don't want to repeat those things and we want the church to be better and we want people to understand Jesus more. And so learning about these things and these events hopefully will help us to have better conversations where we currently are. And, uh, and once again, I think that with communities uh, of color and um, LGBTQ+, plus, um, we, we have tended to repeat history, and it's no wonder that they don't want anything to do with the church. Um, and and we, people would just say, well, they're just sinners, and uh, maybe we need to look in the mirror and say maybe the reason they don't want to be a part of the church is because they've not seen a good representation of who Jesus is. And because um, people were attracted to Jesus, they, they loved him, especially people who... Um, 
who were on the underside of society. They loved Jesus because he loved them and wanted them and said they could be a part of what was going on, what was happening. Um, I, another uh, thing that, uh, that, that came up that I think is so interesting is how the whole idea of the Pope and how his power and um, infallibility is, is not as old of an idea as you might think and, and how, um, yeah, I don't know that that changes a whole lot, but I just think it shows that sometimes we think things have been set in stone since God created the earth, but there were things that were happening with the whole, um, you know, the Catholic States and, and what that whole thing was about that, that spurred that into motion. And, um, and when you understand why all the things surrounding it, then you think, yeah, they were just looking for anything, right? They were, how do we keep this state? How do we keep this, this, this going? And we have to have a leader and we have to give the leader the power that he needs to make decisions because we can't be there all the time. And so I think that, uh, that was once again, kind of interesting. Another thing that came up in a couple of people, um, a couple of people's papers were, how when America was founded, so little of the population was was Christian, uh, would be considered Christian. Five to 10%, I think, is what the book talked about. And how, once again, I think we just believed that everybody that got on the boat and came over were these die hard, like, they just wanted to worship God the way they wanted to. And um, I think they were wanting to, to not have to worship God. And England was a state church, and so everybody, that was the the... the the denom. And so if you weren't, if you wanted to worship, uh, any other God or any other way or any, have any other thoughts, you were not allowed to, um, you weren't able to. And so they were, I think, fleeing that and, uh, we're looking for that freedom of separation of church and state and, and not having the government or the state be the, um, the heavy in, in determining who you worshiped and how you worshiped. And, um, and uh, and I think that it points to once again, uh, Jeannie talked about how we've always been focused on individuals, and how this is what I want to do, and and sometimes that's to the neglect of trying to figure out, but what is the greater good for our society? And and our nation has just been built on individual rights, and you have your rights, and you have this, um, and the Bill of Rights, and and all of this, and, and we we claim it sometimes as gospel truth. But it's just interesting that sometimes when you read Jesus and the Gospels, it, it does tend to be this understanding about not what your rights are, but you've surrendered those rights for the good of the greater, um, for the good of, of all. And and I think of Mark 10 where Jesus says, the Gentiles, they lord it over people, their power, but not so with you. If you want to be great, you got to serve. So in serving, you're giving up what you uh, potentially could lay claim to. You're giving up your rights so that you can serve your people. And Jesus then says, but if you want to be the greatest, you got to be the, you got to serve everybody, all people. And, and it makes me think of uh, what is called the kenosis passage, right? The incarnation passage in Philippians 2, where Jesus didn't even consider equality with God, right? But he took on the very nature of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And, um, and that's why he was exalted and, and so we, we, we hear these things, I think, so often in our culture, and we, we play into them, but we have to understand that, that what ultimately gives us our identity is Scripture, and more specifically Jesus, um, and that Jesus is the one that we are seeking to follow. And so we, we put aside anything that would come into contradiction with him. And so often in our in, in history, and you, you see this in church history, we have our ideas and we want to attach Jesus to them, and every side does it. Um, and in our context, Republicans do it, Democrats do it, um, Independents, Tea Party, I mean, just name it. They, they want Jesus to be a part of what they're doing, but they don't want Jesus to be the whole of what they're doing. And um, it, it sounds good when you can throw a Bible verse in there, but it, the Bible verse, you don't have to really quote it in context or anything you just got to use it and people are like oh man this this guy's awesome and um and so i think we've had these moments once again throughout history uh where slavery was um promoted by the church in the south and and was said to be biblical um, by the pastors and then you move to segregation a little bit later on and 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 white evangelical pastors were 
we're promoting this. That's why we have a Southern Baptist convention is they, they separated from the Baptist and created a Southern Baptist convention because they thought that, that they should be able to do to, to have slaves or to be segregated or to, to whatever. And so there's this, this history that we attach Bible to things, but way out of context, way out of the understanding of who Jesus was and who he came to be and who he showed us to be. So we just got to be careful. We just got to be careful. I, th I think AJ pointed out once again that we have to really study the text, the Bible, in the context that it was written to get a better understanding for for what it means today. And I think that's really, really big deal. Really big deal. And so as we're studying church history, um, once again, all these you learn these things, you're like, oh my goodness, this makes it just makes it different. I feel like like it it changes things when you start to understand that all of these things aren't um, potentially what you thought they were. And so I think that's why it's important to have a good grasp, once again, that as you're being leaders in the church, you can try to steer and, and help people understand better to say, we've made this mistake before, we've done this before, and, and we're, 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 we're going to repeat it if we don't change course. And so we have examples that we can look at that, um, that help us steer or guide or direct where God might be leading us in the future, what should be important to us and what shouldn't be important to us. How do we lead? How do we help people understand um, who Jesus is? And once again, we have these glaring examples of, of people that, that got it wrong. Uh, sometimes, uh, not everybody did, but sometimes as I think John was talking about how you know, these people who were speaking against slavery and, and speaking against, you know, Wilberforce was mentioned and, um, uh, oh, the, the, the Clapham community, right. And, and all of their work about getting rid of slave trade and, and, and taking on Wilberforce after he died, his, his mantle. And, um, and so I think that there's good examples too. And, uh, we have to, to pick up on those and, and, and make sure that, that people, our people understand that there are people that we need to, to learn more from. Once again, those people sometimes aren't the loudest voices, um, but there are other voices that we listen to. So we need to bring out the people like these people were, we're fighting for equality. We're fighting for justice. We're fighting for understanding that God created all human beings. And, um, and so we need to lift them up and, um, and not maybe sometimes the voices that are the loudest among us. Um, a couple of things uh, also that came out uh, in John's writing, and um, I think that was really interesting. He, thought, he asked the question, uh, he was talking about how sometimes people just used um, human intuition and reason, but they didn't to get at truth, but they didn't really look at scripture or tradition, and um, just kind of made it up, right? And uh, asked if I thought this was a threat to the Church of the Nazarene. Um, I think anything is a threat. <laughs> I'm not saying it's happening, but I think anything could happen. And to think that we are um, that we are somehow above all of those things just because we believe in holiness, I think is is a huge, huge mistake. And so that's why we have to keep being humble and have to keep coming back to. Um, trying to understand who God wants us to be and um, and to never think that we've arrived or or that we have it all figured out, but we have to continually be um, humbling ourselves before Jesus and, and saying, am I, am I speaking truth? Am I promoting who it is you're asking us to be, what it is you're asking us to do? Um, and so are we in danger of that? Absolutely. Um, but I'm not saying we're doing it. I'm just saying we're always one step away, right, from from doing things that potentially could be contradictory to, to bringing God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And I think you see this most often with prosperity gospel, right? Um, it, it sounds good. It's very um, heartwarming to people, but it's just hard to find it in the Bible. And, and it allows people to give a whole lot of money so that I could potentially fly on a private jet. Um, but is it really... To really how things work, how what the Bible talks about, how the world works, and how He works. Um, so yeah, I think that that we have to 
always be careful because once again, I feel like we're always one step away from, from repeating history and it shouldn't scare us. It should humble us to continually beg for God's presence to lead us and guide us and direct us and not, um, so no, I don't think that, that we should be like walking around worried, but as we are in step with the spirit and as we are trying to understand more of how the spirit works and who the spirit is, I think it helps us to, um, to truly understand and, and walk humbly once again. And he will lead us if we are submitting to him. He will guide our paths as, as scripture says. So I think it's, uh, I think it's really, really important. Um, and then this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. And um, like I said, just a short video just to kind of hit on some of the things that, that are being talked about in the book and that you're bringing forth that I think are really important. Um, once again, it's one of John's questions, but he talks about how... Um, in America, they were really big on the separation of church and state, and 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 trying to 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 set that up. Now, I think that that is a good thing. Um, I really do, but I I think that it does um, bring up some things that that I think sometimes we don't think about. But the question was, do you po- do you see a possibility of the church being hemmed? You talk about how a lot of times churches weren't welcome in these public debates or public. Um, ideas or situations or circumstances because of the separation of church and state. And so a lot of times people would use that as a way to, they didn't want the church to have input into what was happening in society. And so he says, do you see a possibility of the church being hemmed out of the public square in the future? Um, sure. Absolutely. Um, but I don't think it means that the church will be, has to be ineffective. I don't even think it means that the church can't have sway in what's happening in the culture. If we think that the only place we can do that is is at the governor's table or in Washington, D.C., um, then we've really sold ourselves short and sold the gospel short. But you got to remember, these people... Uh, the Jewish people were on the underside of society. They weren't in control. The Roman government was in control. And yet these 12 dudes that followed, well, I guess 11, literally changed the world. And we are having this class right now because of 11 guys who didn't have political power, who didn't have a seat at the, the, the government table, who were oppressed, who were burned at the stake, who were um, crucified, who were pushed to, were imprisoned, um, we are sitting here today because of those people. And so I think a lot of times we we clamor for power and we think that that's what we have to have to have an influence. And I'm not saying that's not important. Like if God's given uh, people uh, that that privilege and that, that's that seat, that's awesome. But sometimes we think that's the only way that we can affect culture and affect change. And so I think that we have to, 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 to potentially start to think about what does it look like to be um, the church that that changes culture, not from the top down, but from the bottom up? How do we totally allow the spirit to radically transform people's hearts and lives that as they are living every day, they make the culture different because of their presence in the culture? Like people say, they kicked prayer out of school in the 1960s. I'm not sure the date exactly. Um, Or they kicked Jesus out of school. That's the the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. as long as there's Christian students who are going to that school, then guess who's in the school? We believe that it's Jesus living in us in the school. Just because you can't say a prayer over the intercom, like you think that somehow Jesus is like, well, I guess my work here is done. I have no nothing to do here. Uh, there's no way for me to get in here. Like that's the most bogus thing I've ever heard in my life. It limits Jesus dramatically and the power that he has. And so are we going to be hemmed out of, of having seats at tables in, in, in what the world says is where the power is and where the decisions are made? Potentially, and, and I wouldn't shock me, but it doesn't mean that we can't still bring about change in culture and that God's spirit can't help us to bring about change in people's lives. And, um, and as we live and as we do the things that we do and as we're in the community and as we are um, being the hands and feet, salt and light, being all the things that God is asking us to do. Um, like I said, change can happen. Um, 
change will happen and maybe better change will happen. Um, you can't legislate morality. I think somebody put that uh, a couple weeks ago. You can't. So we don't, we don't have to get all these laws passed in order for people to become more like Jesus. Um, we should fight for laws. Like I said, don't hear what I'm not saying. We should potentially be in that arena. But if that ever goes away, um, God's kingdom will still march on and we can still be a part of what he's doing. So do I see us um, potentially having less of a voice, uh, less and less of a voice? Maybe. But it shouldn't scare us. It should actually make us think, finally, we can do the things that we really think God wants us to do. We don't have to, to, to pretend that we have power in a political world when I think those in politics just appease the Christians uh, so they'll vote for them and um, they don't really care what we think. And so we can finally just get rid of that and we can focus in on who God's really called us to be and focus in on the job he really has for us and focus in on the understanding that he really has for how we should live, what we should think is important, how we should affect the culture and how we really get at that. Um, and so it, it might actually free us to be the people that God's actually called us to be if that were to go away. And um, so it shouldn't scare us. And, and I'm not saying that we should pray for it, or maybe we should, I don't know. But I'm just saying if it happens, it's not the, uh, the end of God's kingdom. Um, could be just the beginning. Could be just the beginning. And so, um, so yeah, uh, once again, great thoughts. Uh, I really, man, I can't say it enough. This is this has been great, and um, and and we're we're like over halfway done. So easiest class you're ever gonna take. So I'm really excited uh, to read your work this week. A couple people still need to turn in week three. Uh, you know who you are. I won't mention any names. Um, and you may have done it by this video. So congratulations on that. I'm really excited about the video you're going to watch next week. Um, Phyllis Tickle is she's an awesome, uh, she was an awesome person, and um, and so I'm really excited, and I think it will kind of um, help us understand potentially a path forward. And she's going to talk about a lot of things that you've been reading about, so it's going to kind of be a refresher on church history and all the different moves. But she's going to put it and kind of. Um, do a broad understanding of of all of the movements and all of the the things that that have been happening, and I think after reading uh, all the material, um, it's going to make even more sense. And you're going to think, yeah, um, you're going to have some of the background information that she doesn't get into the details of, and you're just it's going to be, I think, really really helpful. And um, and so then she but she gives this challenge at the end, and I think that's gonna that's that's worth the 40 minutes um, that you're going to listen to this lady talk for sure. And uh, and so um, just just uh, be encouraged. Uh, I'm excited once again. And then uh, in two weeks, we'll do our last Zoom session. You have one last paper, and man, you're done, right? You're done with this, uh, with this exercise and adventure. Let me know if you have any questions. I uh, hope that um, this is beneficial. A lot of you say it's been really, really good and interesting, and I'm excited about that. But let me know if you have questions uh, beyond that. And after you watch this, hopefully in your paper, more questions will come up as we read next week about uh, the, the you know the beginning of the 20th century and the world wars. And um, it just starts to, to get even closer to where we find ourselves and just all the things happening and going on. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's a lot. But once again, I hope that we learn from uh, our history and, and do our best not to repeat it. Um, yeah, I don't know that, that we're there right now, but we can help be a part of the conversation in our churches and with our friends and family. Um, and part of it may just be educating them. Like, did you know this happened? And did you know this happened? And did you know this was true? Um, and just helping them understand. Uh, that always helps, I think, to give a, different, a broader perspective on where we are and why we are where we are. And um, so, yeah. All right. All uh, right. Love you guys. Thinking about you guys. Praying for you guys. Let me know if you have any questions. And um, yeah, keep turning your work. Talk to you later. Bye.